Union General William S. Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland had maneuvered Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army of Tennessee out of their positions southeast of Nashville during the Tullahoma Campaign. Now, Rosecrans was focused on the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee, a vital railroad hub for the Confederacy. His intention was to fool Bragg into thinking that he was going to cross the Tennessee River upriver, but was in actuality moving his army south of Chattanooga to cross Lookout Mountain to get in the rear of Bragg's army. Most of Bragg's forces were concentrated near Chattanooga with his cavalry spread out in a wide net across the landscape. He was outnumbered significantly, with about 50,000 men in his army, as opposed to the approximately 70,000 men in the Army of the Cumberland. Bragg's cavalry under Joseph Wheeler were tasked with watching the river crossings downstream of Chattanooga, but Wheeler sent most of his troops to rest camps far from the scenes of action, so Bragg knew little about the Union Army movements to the south. The Union main thrust began on August 29, 1863. By September 5th, the Army of the Cumberland had crossed the Tennessee River, a success for Rosecrans. Alexander McCook's 20th Corps was at the south end of the line, George Thomas's 14th Corps was in the center, and Thomas L. Crittenden's 21st Corps was to the north, converging on Chattanooga. Bragg was in a horrible state mentally because he had no good information on which gap in Lookout Mountain the Union Army would emerge from. On September 7th, Bragg began to move his army south for fear of getting cut off from Atlanta. This left the Union in control of Chattanooga. Crittenden's troops pushed southeast toward Tunnel Hill, Georgia, while McCook's Corps approached the Confederate Army from the south. George Thomas's Corps worked its way over Lookout Mountain and was about to enter McLemore's Cove. Rosecrans's plan involved and relied on his army getting to Lafayette. On September 10th, Negley's division moved into McLemore's Cove with Thomas being extremely cautious, knowing that at least part of his corps could be isolated and destroyed if the Confederates acted quickly. Luckily for him, the Southern Army was in full confusion. Bragg had sent Claiborne's division, Heinemann's division, and elements of Simon Bolivar Buckner's corps to trap Thomas's men in McLemore's Cove. Colonel William Surwell's brigade led the way into the cove, followed by Colonel Timothy R. Stanley's brigade. The two colonels found Confederate cavalry posted in the cove and General Negley wanted to force them out, so Surwell's men pushed forward and drove the cavalry to the foot of Doug Gap, but as his men got close to the Gap, the resistance increased. The Union infantry got close enough to see that the Confederate infantry had fortified the Gap. Surwell pulled back to a safe distance. Those rebels in the Gap were commanded by Major General Patrick Claiborne, who was waiting for General Heinemann to launch an attack from the Northwest. Then the Irishman was to deliver a devastating blow to the unsuspecting Federals. At about that time, Negley received word that a large Confederate column was approaching from the north. To mask his withdrawal closer to Lookout Mountain, Negley ordered Surwell and Stanley to push back the rebel skirmishers. Then at 3 a.m., with no Confederates in sight, they pulled back to a ridge around the Davis House. Negley asked his corps commander, George Thomas, for reinforcements, and by 8.30 a.m., elements of Baird's division arrived. Scribner replaced Surwell's brigade, while that brigade moved to the left, and Starkweather moved into Stanley's position. Braxton Bragg had ordered a 6 a.m. attack by his division commanders north of McLemore's Cove, and Claiborne waited for that attack to commence so that he could launch his own assault, but no attack came. Generals Heinemann and Buckner began to fear that they could not attack in their condition, and that they may be attacked themselves or even outnumbered, so they delayed even further. It was 5 p.m., 11 hours, after Bragg had wanted an attack to begin before the Confederate divisions of Simon Bolivar Buckner pressed down the road toward Negley and Baird's men. By that time, the delay in attacking had given Thomas enough time to pull most of his two divisions through Stevens Gap to safety, along with the wagon train, leaving only a small force to cover the retreat, and that is the only force that Buckner's men came into contact with. The Confederates made a weak attempt at attacking the heels of the Union Army, but to no avail. The Battle of Davis's Crossroads was over. To the north, over the course of those same two days, Union forces clashed with Confederates at Graysville on September 10th and Leet's Tanyard on September 11th, as each side attempted to find out where the other was. McCook, to the south, knew he was to meet up with Thomas near Lafayette, but as he moved closer, Confederate resistance became stronger, and with Thomas nowhere in sight, he concluded that he would need to move back across Lookout Mountain. To the north, Crittenden's men were coming together. Bragg sent orders to Polk to attack the Union Corps, 
but Polk saw that he was outnumbered and declined to attack. Although McCook retreated from Lafayette, Bragg was still concerned about a possible attack from that sector and sent Buckner's troops to march south to link up with John Breckinridge. Not content with having Breckinridge and Buckner at Lafayette, he had Polk and Walker also do the long march, further exhausting his army. However, Bragg would get great news. The threat to the south was gone. Rosecrans and General Ambrose Burnside in East Tennessee had not linked up, and troops under Lieutenant General James Longstreet from the Army of Northern Virginia were on their way to reinforce him. Bragg then moved his army north to confront Rosecrans, who was concentrating his army at Lee and Gordon's Mill. On September 18th, Braxton Bragg wanted his Confederate army to cross West Chickamauga Creek at various locations north of the Union main line and cut it off from Chattanooga and by attacking its left flank, drive it south. Guarding the fords and bridges across the creek were Federal cavalry under Colonel Robert Minty and mounted infantry equipped with Spencer repeating rifles under Colonel John T. Wilder. To the north, Minty would come into contact with elements of Longstreet's Corps under Brigadier General Bushrod Johnson. The Confederate infantry didn't have cavalry to scout ahead of them so Johnson sent out Colonel Fulton's brigade to probe the Union position. Around this time, General Nathan Bedford Forrest arrived with a handful of his cavalry and began working his way around the flank of Minty's line. Just before noon, Minty withdrew closer to the bridge to shore up his battle line. Minty could see dust clouds rising up to the northeast and feared that Confederate troops would attempt to outflank him using the bridges and fords to the north, so he asked Wilder for help. Wilder sent Minty part of his brigade to watch those locations while Minty engaged with Forrest and Johnson. Forrest would take Fulton's 17th Tennessee and his own cavalry to the south in an attempt to capture what he thought was Minty's camp. When Johnson and Fulton crossed a ridge, they could see how small the Union force was, so Johnson called up for Gregg's brigade to align on Fulton's right and McNair to fall in behind to act in a supporting role for the other two brigades. Braxton Bragg's plan to quickly cross the creek and unite his army on the other side for a major assault in order to flank the Union left and be able to push it further south had hit a snag at Reed's Bridge. While Johnson worked to outflank Minty, Wilder's men guarded Alexander's Bridge to the south. After sending aid to Minty, Wilder only had Company F and A of the 72nd Indiana, five companies of the 98th Illinois, and the 17th Indiana to guard his sector. He also had many men posted at various fords along the creek so that the Confederates could not launch a surprise flanking maneuver. Brigadier General St. John Liddell ordered Walthall's Mississippi Brigade forward to take the bridge. However, the thick underbrush disrupted the brigade's battle lines and each regiment arrived at different times. Plus, Company A of the 72nd Indiana had ripped up the floor of the bridge and created a breastwork out of its pieces. Although some of the Mississippians made it into the creek and attempted to outflank the outnumbered Federals, the firepower from the Spencer rifles created a bloody stalemate. By a little afternoon, the Confederates had thrown elements of two divisions against the two diminished Union brigades and hadn't been able to drive off the stubborn Federals, and the day was quickly passing. Bragg had planned for them to already be across the creek and well on their way attacking the Union from a northerly direction. To the north, Minty had pulled back across Reed's Bridge, giving ground each time that Johnson's infantry aligned themselves for an attack. Minty's men had ripped up the planks after crossing and threw them into the creek below, which carried them downstream. Johnson now had to work to get across Chickamauga Creek, all the while under fire from Union small arms and artillery fire. The 23rd Tennessee ripped boards from the Reed House and barn and repaired the bridge. Fulton's troops formed up, with skirmishers providing cover fire against Union musketry and filed across the bridge to the other side. Gregg's men waded across the creek to the north so that they could form on Fulton's right. Meanwhile, Forrest's cavalry used two fords upstream to cross the creek and finally made it to the west side of the waterway. However, it was late in the day, and both Minty and Wilder knew that they were soon to be flanked if they stayed where they were, so they pulled back nearly two miles. Johnson was now under the direct command of Major General John Bell Hood, who had just arrived on the field with his arm still in a sling from his wounding at Gettysburg. Walker's divisions abandoned the attempt to cross at Alexander's Bridge and moved downstream and crossed there. Additionally, Buckner's two divisions were beginning to cross the creek. Hood and Johnson pushed south after crossing the creek and there would be one more stand before darkness covered the field. Wilder held a position east of Vineyard Field and asked Minty to form on his right. 
Major General Thomas Crittenden and one of his division commanders, Brigadier General Thomas J. Wood, arrived on the field and concluded that no further attack would be made and that there was no substantial Confederate force on that side of the creek. Earlier, when Minty reported to Crittenden about Longstreet's corps being at Ringgold, Crittenden had brushed the information aside, declaring that Longstreet was still in Virginia. Wood examined Wilder's line, and as he did, Johnson's division came into view. Wood frantically rode off to alert Crittenden, who ordered the closest Federal brigade to Wilder's aid. That would be Colonel George F. Dick's brigade of Horatio Van Cleve's 3rd Division. Johnson's men rushed forward and attacked Wilder's line, but like most night battles of the war, not much came of the attacks and the firing faded away as Johnson withdrew his men a short distance and had them build impromptu breastworks. Together, the small commands of Minty and Wilder had delayed vastly superior Confederate columns for hours and by extension threw the timetable for Braxton Bragg's attack plan off schedule an entire day. Although the Confederate advance had been delayed, Rosecrans' Army of the Cumberland could still be cut off from Chattanooga. With that scary thought in his mind, Rosecrans turned his most trusted commander, Major General George Thomas, to extend Crittenden's left to the north and secure the Lafayette Road, which was their connection with Chattanooga. By dawn, Thomas had brought the divisions of Brigadier Generals Absalom Baird and John M. Brannan to the Kelly House and Farmstead. They had marched most of the night and when they arrived, began to cook breakfast. The night before, Colonel Daniel McCook arrived near Reed's Bridge to help in the defense of that sector, but arrived once the majority of the fighting was over. He did take some prisoners, but was ordered by his commander, Gordon Granger, to fall back to Rossville. Before he left, some of his Ohioans tried to burn Reed's Bridge, but Confederates in the area put it out before any damage was done. Since most of McCook's prisoners were from one brigade, he surmised that a lone southern brigade was trapped on the west side of the creek. He informed Thomas of that when he pulled back to Rossville. Thomas wasted no time and moved Brandon's men forward, who were still in the process of cooking their breakfast. The only rebels in the immediate area was a brigade of cavalry ultimately under Forrest, but commanded by Brigadier General Henry Davidson, who had been sent to that sector when it was discovered that McCook's men were attempting to burn the bridge. The brigades of Colonels John T. Croxton and Ferdinand Vanderveer approached Jay's Mill along two roads attempting to find the lone Confederate brigade described by McCook. Croxton ran into the 10th Confederate Cavalry and Vanderveer hit the 1st Georgia Cavalry. Forrest realized he couldn't hold back two Federal brigades with the men he had, so he instructed his men to hold as long as possible until infantry support could be brought up. The Wizard of the Saddle sent notes to Bragg, General Walker, and Walker's brigade commanders, and all obliged to send help. The brigades of Colonel Claudius Wilson and Brigadier General Matthew Ector marched north to help Forrest throw back the Union brigades. Wilson formed on Forrest's left, with Ector instructed to keep marching north to tackle Union forces coming down the Reeds Bridge Road. Wilson pushed towards Croxton's line, who was surprised with such a large force meeting him and saw that his right could be outflanked so he began to move the 10th Kentucky in that direction. But while the 10th was moving behind the 74th Indiana, the Hoosiers confused the Kentuckians' orders with their own and thought they were to perform a general retreat and fled about 200 yards to the rear. Croxton worked to reorganize the 74th, and while he did that, the 10th Kentucky performed a brave charge to send back Wilson's brigade, which provided Croxton with enough time to get the 74th back in line with the rest of the brigade. Croxton had been falling back gradually as the Confederate brigades came closer and closer, hoping that Vanderveer would come up on his left so that his line would be more secure. But Ector's movements would prevent that juncture. The skirmishers in front of Brannan had done a spectacular job of stopping the Union advance, and now that Ector was ready to attack, the situation seemed dire for the Union. The Rebel Brigade rushed forward, but the artillery from Battery I of the 4th U.S. Battery Positioned in between Vanderveer's regiments, along with an incredible volley of musketry, forced Ector back. It was a significant blow to the rebels. Meanwhile, Brannan realized his brigades were heavily engaged and sought to reinforce them at once. He took his last brigade, that under Colonel John Connell, and divided it. He sent the 31st Ohio to help Croxton, while he personally led the rest of the brigade and the 4th Michigan Battery to Vanderveer's aid. Ector made another attack, but it was just as costly as the first. Every mounted officer lost a horse. Two regimental commanders went down along with a number of flag bearers. Colonel William H. Young of the 9th Texas received a bullet to his chest. 
his second of five wounds he would receive during the entire war. The attacks, although unsuccessful for the Confederates, moved Vanderveer's line to where it faced more south than east. It was 10 a.m. and Brannon had thrown in all of his brigades, so he sent word to General Thomas for additional reinforcements. Thomas called up for Baird to come to Brannon's assistance. Meanwhile, Hector grew concerned about more Union regiments in his front, and particularly his right flank. He told Forrest about his concern for that area, and Forrest replied, Tell General Hector that he need not bother about his right flank. I'll take care of it. To the south, one of Baird's brigades, under Colonel Benjamin Scribner, charged into Wilson's left flank, shattering it completely. Wilson ran over to that flank and tried to rally what was left, but to no avail. His right crumbled after that. Scribner's brigade got broken up by the successful charge, and its commander had trouble putting them back together. Hector kept up the pressure against Connell and Vanderveer, but he was not expecting what happened next. Hector told Forrest about his exposed left flank, and Forrest sent word back, Tell General Hector that by God I am here, and I will take care of his left flank as well as his right. Unfortunately for Forrest and Hector, the cavalry commander did not have enough troops to do that. Brigadier General John H. King's brigade slammed into Hector's flank and sent the Confederates running. Many of Hector's men were captured by King's men. Thomas's division had thrown back two brigades of Confederates, and his brigades reorganized themselves after the successful attacks. At that point, a short lull came over the battlefield. It was 11 a.m., and both sides had begun to reinforce their lines, preparing for what may come. George Thomas asked Rosecrans for more reinforcements, which Rosecrans happily gave. Brigadier General Richard W. Johnson's division and Major General John M. Palmer's division moved north to support Thomas's expanding line. Bragg was now heavily concerned about his own battle line, as his plan to push the Union Army south away from Chattanooga had been unsuccessful. The rest of William Walker's corps swung north to engage Thomas's successful troops. Bragg's left was secure under Generals Hood, Buckner, and Cheatham, so he detached Cheatham's division of Polk's corps and sent it north to add to Walker's left. Scribner and the other Federal brigades under Thomas were busy celebrating their recent victory when Walthall and Govan's men attacked. They were told that there would be reinforcements coming from the southwest, so not to fire on them, but this was the enemy. Battery A of the 1st Michigan Artillery held on with the help of the 10th Wisconsin for a short time. The commander of the artillery, Lieutenant George Van Pelt, died defending the guns against the advancing rebels, but eventually all the Federals were forced to pull back. Starkweather didn't have time to change the front of his brigade before the gray lines wrapped around his flanks. The brigade made up of men from Wisconsin, Illinois, and Pennsylvania held out for a short time, but they too fell back in disorder. Now there were no federal units between Govan and Walthall's men and the flank and rear of King's regulars. Baird arrived in time to tell King to orient part of his brigade to the south, but it was too late. He had only managed to get his battle line to partially face in that direction before the Confederates swarmed over the landscape, capturing a great many of the blue-clad troops. King alone lost around 500 as prisoners, over one-third of the fighting force he brought into the engagement. In less than 30 minutes, the two Confederate brigades had devastated the Union's left flank, but the disorganization from their success and the casualties accumulated from the attacks was wearing on them. Walthall's men continued forward and attacked Connell's depleted brigade. However, the 9th Ohio, made up mostly of German immigrants in Cincinnati, had been left behind to guard the wagons, but Connell brought them to the front to reinforce the rest of his brigade. When the Mississippians came forward, without orders, the Germans charged forward with a yell, stunning the exhausted rebels. The attack was so unexpected, and even a surprise to Connell, that they drove the Mississippians away. To the east, Croxton's brigade, fresh from the rear, where they filled their cartridge boxes and rested, had marched south upon hearing the sound of battle, and seeing that their comrades were retreating in disorder. Once he was in position, Croxton ordered a bayonet charge that drove Govan's men away. A private in Croxton's brigade recalled later that Croxton ordered a bayonet charge, which was performed in a style never surpassed and scarcely ever equaled, driving them in the wildest confusion, actually running clear through their lines and capturing many prisoners. Scribner, King, Vanderveer, and Connell guarded the Reeds Bridge Road, and Nathan Bedford Forrest was going to attempt to outflank the Union along that road. As he moved Dibrell's brigade to the northwest, so moved Vanderveer and Connell to meet the threat. When the rebel cavalry attacked, 
The infantry line, studded with artillery, convinced the attackers to fall back in great haste and signaled to Forrest that the line was too strong at the moment to turn it. The fighting in this sector died down around noon. Walker's reserve corps had been bloodied significantly, and the divisions of Baird and Brannan had eventually repulsed the attackers, but at a great cost. Most of the Union divisions pulled back, leaving only Croxton out front after chasing Govan's men back toward West Chickamauga Creek. This lull, like the other, would be short as Cheatham's fresh division moved out. By midday, Braxton Bragg was still trying to find and possibly turn the left flank of the Union Army to his north, but the stiff resistance in that sector had confounded him. Most of the fighting up until that point had been exploratory probes by each side. The rest of the Union line was fairly thin, with Rosecrans waiting on the rest of his troops to make it to the field. Major General Benjamin Cheatham's division was sent by Bragg to support Walker's troops, but Walker's rebels had been pushed from the field. Croxton's brigade was out front of the Union line. It sat astride the Brotherton Road, with three regiments north of the road and three regiments south of it. The Federals didn't expect to see any Confederates after the last ones they sent back. Similarly, Brigadier General John K. Jackson did not expect to find Federals so close to his position when he moved out. He was expecting to encounter elements of Walker's regiments he had been sent to support. When the Southerners saw the Federals, Jackson wasted no time and ordered a charge, which sent back the right half of the brigade, but Croxton was able to keep them together and bring back the left as well, setting up a defensive position on a small ridge. Croxton didn't have to wait long for help to arrive. Johnson and Palmer's divisions had been ordered to Thomas's aid, and Old Pap Thomas sent them into battle as soon as they were available. In the front right of Johnson's battle line was the brigade of Brigadier General August Willock, a German immigrant who, at a young age, adopted the ideas of socialism and communism, and even challenged Karl Marx himself to a duel when they disagreed on that movement's course of action. In Palmer's left front was the brigade under Brigadier General William B. Hazen, one of the most capable Union Brigade commanders in the Army of the Cumberland. His stubborn stand at the Round Forest at Stones River helped save the Union Army and its hold on the Nashville Pike. Those units faced a fresh and veteran force in the form of Cheatham's division. Johnson and Palmer moved through and beside Croxton, sending back Jackson's brigade. Palmer refused his right flank per the orders of Rosecrans, who knew the biggest problem facing the Federal units in that area was Confederates attacking from a southward direction. When Jackson fell back, he came on line with Brigadier General Preston Smith's brigade. Both advanced on the two Union divisions. By this point in the war, Union tactics had changed to brigades putting two regiments in front and two in back. This helped stabilize their lines during an attack, but Confederates were still placing their regiments side by side, which meant their battle lines were less stable, but they could overlap the Union battle lines more easily. On the Confederate left, Brigadier General Marcus Wright was moving his brigade toward the right. However, Wright mistakenly thought he was in the center of Cheatham's line and was expecting a brigade to come up on his left. Wright was new to brigade command in combat, and his promotion over one of the brigade's colonels irritated its troops. Before he knew it, Wright ran into Gross's brigade. Smith and Jackson's men were feeling overmatched, especially Smith, who had attempted to attack the Union line through Brock Field, and his exposed condition led to heavy casualties. At 1.30 p.m., he pulled back to the other end of the field and sent word to his division commander that his ammunition was running low, but that he could hold on long enough for another brigade to relieve him. Cheatham quickly ordered up support. Brigadier General Otho Strahl and Brigadier General George Maney would replace Smith and Jackson. For Strahl, Cheatham told him not to advance through the field, but to take up a position in the trees on the south end of it. But he did just the opposite, marching into the field. Strahl quickly realized his mistake when his men began taking heavy casualties. Adding to the confusion, a fire broke out in the field and the smoke flew into the eyes of the Confederate soldiers. Quickly, Strahl moved them out of the desperate situation. To the north, George Maney, a Tennessean, veteran of the Mexican-American War and a proven tough fighter for the Army of Tennessee, relieved Jackson's battered lines. Cheatham was obviously confused. He went in thinking he would find the Union left flank, but was met by large numbers of Federals coming in a direction he did not anticipate, and his men were getting mauled. To the west, Rosecrans prepared to send more troops into the ever-extending battle line. 
part of Horatio Van Cleve's division, attacked the east of the Lafayette Road and slammed into Wright's left flank. Two of his regiments did attempt to turn to engage the arriving Federals, and Carnes' battery wheeled about and delivered double canister into the blue ranks, but it only delayed the Union advance that sent Wright's men backpedaling to the east. Bragg, seeing the deteriorating situation, had pulled a division from Simon Bolivar Buckner's corps under Alexander P. Stewart and sent it to his right. They were coming into position as Wright was pulling back. The conglomeration of various corps on the Confederate right would make the chain of command confusing over the course of the next couple of days. Elements of three different corps were engaging in that sector and Bragg placed Polk in command of that wing, even though only one division, Cheatham's, belonged to his actual command. On the Confederate right and Union left, both sides were running low on ammunition, so those blue and gray troops needed to be relieved or find some way to throw back the enemy. Colonel Joseph Dodge came up from the reserve and the brigades of Willick and Baldwin began to push against Strahlemany. Willick utilized his advanced fire technique where his regiments were formed into four rows and the front row would fire, the second row would advance through the first row and fire, then the third would advance through the first and second rows and fire and so on. This created a constant wall of musketry, which pushed the Confederates off the field. The Union left was holding firm and threw back every attempt to dislodge them from their position, but Confederate reinforcements were headed toward the Lafayette Road. Alexander P. Stewart was a graduate of West Point in 1842 and only served three years in the peacetime army before resigning to become a college professor. His division was not spread out like Cheatham's. He had lined his brigades up one behind the other. Brigadier General Henry Clayton's brigade led the division, and even though it only had three regiments, it was the largest brigade in the division, mostly because the 38th and 36th Alabama regiments had spent the war guarding Mobile and had yet to hear guns fired in anger. The Alabamians advanced on Van Cleve's men, but even though their flank was turned toward Gross's brigade, they were too far away from the Federal bullets to do major damage. The Confederate line pushed the front line of Beatty and Dick's brigades, but the second line held firm, and it broke down into a static firefight between the two groups. Despite their inexperience, Clayton's men stood their ground and withstood the rage of battle until their cartridge boxes became empty. He reported this to Stewart, who replaced Clayton with Brown's brigade. The flames from the rifled muskets and cannons ignited the dry foliage, and smoke and flames concealed friend and foe. Nevertheless, each side threw lead at one another, trying to make the other break. Major General Joseph Reynolds had sent his brigades to other sectors and was left with Edward King's brigade and two regiments. He sent King to the right to provide support for Van Cleve's line, leaving him in command of only two regiments. When the 6th Ohio came to the rear to look for ammunition wagons, Reynolds took them in as his reserve, but he wouldn't have those three regiments for long. A gap in the line forced him to send the 75th Indiana into the breach. It was about 3 p.m and the battle was still raging. Brigades and divisions who had taken part in the battle rested, and those yet not engaged were being brought to the front. The battle was starting to shift southward. Braxton Bragg had exhausted his forces occupying his right, so he would now use Hood's men who occupied the center. The area across from Hood's men was fairly open. Rosecrans had attempted to fill that gap in his line all day, but troops had been diverted to the hotly contested area to the north. Part of the division under General Jefferson C. Davis would be thrust into that sector and a deadly firefight would emerge. As the brigades of King, Dick, and Beatty fought off the repeated assaults against their lines by Alexander P. Stewart, General Jefferson C. Davis's division deployed just to the south to help protect the Lafayette Road. Davis pulled two regiments from Carlin's brigade and made the 21st Illinois part of the divisional reserves while the 81st Indiana, under an inexperienced regimental commander, helped guard the 2nd Minnesota Battery. Heggs Brigade, which contained the 15th Wisconsin, also known as the Scandinavian Regiment because of its ranks being filled with Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes, moved into the timber, not knowing what awaited them inside the woods. They ran into the divisions of Bushrod Johnson and Evander Law. Despite the overwhelming numerical superiority, Johnson didn't order his men forward, at least not at the moment. Haig brought up his reserve to extend his line to the south. Finally, Davis sent Carlin's 21st Illinois to help stabilize Haig's line. But the pressure was compounding, which forced Davis to send in the rest of the brigade to the right of Haig. Both brigades put up a strong fight against the southerners, but help was coming from the south. 
Colonel Sidney Barnes' brigade was coming up the Lafayette Road. Major General John Bell Hood became impatient. He had waited most of the day, and now that the enemy was in his front, he would press them. He ordered his two divisions forward. However, a horrible series of miscommunications between the brigades led to a jumbled mass of Confederates that lost valuable strength for an attack. Gregg was supposed to stay connected to Fulton's left, but Gregg's left was engaged with Haig and couldn't break away, which resulted in the 3rd and 41st Tennessee joining Fulton, while the others remained to the south. Furthermore, Law was either ordered or thought he was ordered to the southwest. Sheffield, part of Law's division, disconnected from the rest of the division and attacked the Union line alongside Stewart's division. The overall Union line that stretched alongside the Lafayette Road and jutted out along the Brotherton Road had now been split by Hood's actions. Once into the breach, Confederate forces would spread out, with some heading north while others headed south. To the south, the brigades of Robertson, Benning, McNair, part of Gregg's, and some others would fight against the divisions of Jefferson C. Davis, Thomas J. Wood, and Philip Sheridan. Haig's line held out for as long as possible and concentrated just north of Vineyard Field. However, the Confederates who passed by his flank sent the 35th Illinois running to the rear until they could regroup. Forming behind Haig's line in support was Harker's brigade. Wood, the division commander, was attempting to form on Van Cleve's right, but when the Confederates began to break through the line, he quickly threw his men into the engagement, with the 3rd Kentucky and 125th Ohio refusing the battle line to the north as part of Gregg's brigade started to engage Haig and Harker. On the Union right, Barnes's brigade, marching diagonally toward what he thought was the Confederate flank, was hit with an enfiladen fire from the right. The musketry was so deadly that it sent Barnes's men through Carlin's troops, who was so disturbed by the rush of retreating comrades that they too fell back. This afforded Trigg's brigade of Virginians and Floridians to capture multiple batteries of artillery. Trigg ordered his troops forward, but only the 6th Florida followed. A miscommunication led to the 54th Virginia and the 7th Florida to go north to support Robertson's brigade. Nevertheless, the 6th had a chance to capture a significant number of Union guns. However, the quick-thinking Colonel Wilder and Colonel George P. Buell sent elements of their brigades to stop the Floridians and send them back across Vineyard Field. Wilder knew that the situation was beginning to deteriorate, so he recalled his regiments back to his original line and turned his attention to the north. The 25th Arkansas, 39th North Carolina, 30th Tennessee, and 7th Texas had pushed across the Lafayette Road, threatening the flank and rear of Davis and Wood's divisions. Wilder acted fast, sending the 98th Illinois north to confront the invading rebels, along with turning the guns of Captain Eli Lilly's 18th Indiana Light Artillery to confront them. Similarly, Harker's men moved north. The troops under McNair and Gregg realized they could nearly be surrounded and pulled back across the road. A major Confederate attack had been thrown back, but there was another one coming. Brigadier General Jerome Robertson's brigade slammed into the beleaguered Union troops, sending many of them running for the rear. A few of them did stand their ground, but the fresh Confederate brigade was too strong. However, when Robertson's regiments turned to fight Wilder's men, the Union colonel's position allowed him to deliver devastating volleys from their Spencer repeating rifles into the men from Texas and Arkansas. Wilder ultimately halted Robertson, who called for Hood to send him support. Brigadier General Henry L. Benning was close behind Robertson and would lend the much needed help. Wilder's front was protected by a stream bed about halfway between his defensive barricade at the tree line and the Lafayette Road. The dry weather of the past few weeks had evaporated the water so most of the men who described it referred to the bed as a ditch or the dry ditch. The banks were steep, cut into the field about five feet deep. The ditch angled across the field from southeast to the northwest, growing shallower as it wound its way north. For many, it would become known as the ditch of death. When Benning moved into the field to combat Wilder, Wilder's troops kneeled in double ranks and poured lead into the Georgians from the repeaters while other regiments from the shattered divisions stood behind them in double ranks firing their single-shot rifled muskets. This hail of lead sent the Georgians into the ditch. They sought refuge there, and it did provide some protection against the Union bullets. Wilder wanted to get the enemy out of that ditch, which partially protected them from his troops' volleys. So he sent Lilly's battery to the flank of Benning's men and fired down the line of Georgians, causing great havoc in the rebel line. Benning left roughly a third of his force in the ditch before he began a withdrawal. 
elements from many of the Federal Brigades previously sent fleeing behind Wilder's line formed into ranks and sensing the great opportunity to land a devastating blow to the retreating enemy, burst into the field, but the action did not go as well as hoped. The Georgians still had fight in them and slowly gave ground. Eventually, all of the units, both Union and Confederate, withdrew to safety. As the chaos of battle consumed the vineyard field and the ditch of death, Federal troops to the north of the breakthrough were also fighting for their lives. When Major General John Bell Hood's Corps moved forward and broke through the Union line, Evander Law's division and part of Bushrod Johnson's division engaged the divisions of Jefferson C. Davis, Thomas J. Wood, and Philip Sheridan. To the north, the rest of Johnson's division, along with Alexander P. Stewart's division, smashed into the Union line. Johnson's division swung around the flank of King, Beatty, and Dick's brigades, while Bates' brigade moved against Gross's brigade. Behind the Union line, Major General Joseph Reynolds, whose brigades had been plucked from his division and placed at different locations, possessed only the 6th Ohio and 92nd Illinois, and he had only gotten those by picking them up as they came to the rear for ammunition, as in the case with the 6th. He also had assembled 16 artillery pieces perched on a rise in the Brotherton field. When the Union line broke under the pressure of the Confederate assault, many regiments either partially or wholly rallied around those guns. Had Brown's brigade pushed forward instead of falling back because he thought he was unsupported, the Union line may have been lost. Reynolds remembered the moment by saying, I remember seeing Van Cleve telling the boys to go slow, trying to stop his men. They were being driven, but I could not see who was driving them. They were not firing, but were going to the northward in the rear of my line. For King's brigade, it was a complete rout, and the situation was turning deadly for the entire Union army if the attack could not be thwarted. Horatio Van Cleve rode north to find troops to stop the rebels. He came across Brigadier General William B. Hazen's brigade and began bringing them south. In the Brotherton field, the situation was getting worse for the Union. Clayton and Fulton's brigades pushed forward, threatening the flank of the 92nd Illinois, who retreated back to their mounts. This created a chain reaction. With their flanks unsupported, each regiment gave way as the Confederate troops moved through the Brotherton field. Only Hazen's brigade was able to hold on to the ground. Just to the east, Colonel Gross's brigade was about to be hit by a large Confederate attack, and even worse, they were running low on ammunition. The 6th Ohio had already ran low and went to the Lafayette Road to refill their cartridge boxes. When Bates' brigade approached Gross's line, the musketry raged between the two sides as the Union troops desperately held on. Gross moved the 36th Indiana from a supportive role to the front line to help alleviate the pressure on the other regiments. However, it was to no avail. The Confederates were just too numerous, and the breakthrough at the Brotherton Field forced Gross to pull his men back in order to save his battle line. The Union center was shattered. The success of the Confederate brigades caused a great confusion on the battlefield, though. A lack of communication between the brigade commanders made each leader afraid they had pushed too far without support, and some were fighting alongside units they were not supposed to be fighting with. Sheffield's brigade was a mess, and its deteriorating situation only added to the growing confusion within the Confederate ranks. The bulk of Sheffield's Alabama brigade arrived in Brotherton Field. These regiments were supposed to be fighting alongside Benning and Robertson's brigades, which were engaged a mile south around the Vineyard Field, but had failed to keep that connection drifting to the northwest instead. When an artillery round unhorsed Sheffield early in the advance, command should have went to Colonel Perry of the 44th Alabama, but that regiment had gotten disconnected from the brigade and was fighting with Stewart's division. Colonel William C. Oates ultimately took command of the bulk of those troops, leading them into Brotherton Field. When Colonel Charles Harker's Union Brigade advanced from the south in an attempt to throw back Confederate forces west of the Lafayette Road, the disorganized rebels were taken by surprise. Brigadier General John Gregg was wounded by a 64th Ohio skirmisher and left for dead, but the Southern General would recover from his wounds. As the Union soldiers passed by, they relieved him of many articles, including his sword. With Federal soldiers in their rear, this convinced the two regiments under Gregg to fall back across the road, and Fulton began to turn his regiments toward the south to address the growing problem in that sector. To the north, Bates' successful brigade continued its push to the northwest, chasing routed Federal batteries. Three Union batteries and the 75th Indiana sat at the edge of Poe Field, awaiting the Confederate regiments to appear through the tree line. When the gray lines emerged, 
A destructive fire of artillery and musketry encompassed the field. A member of Bates' brigade recalled that some regiments were almost annihilated. The artillery knocked a hole so large in the 37th Georgia that it split into two units, one headed to the left and one headed to the right. Bates' men couldn't handle the hail of iron and lead and withdrew back into the woods, close to the Brotherton Road. Brigadier General John B. Turchin, a Russian immigrant who had served in the Imperial Russian Army before coming to the United States and settling in Chicago, was a tough fighter, and since there was silence in his front, he deployed to the west and attacked the right flank of the Confederate breakthrough. However, Turchin's men did not pursue the enemy. They withdrew to their stable battle line. While all this was going on, Rosecrans and Thomas were attempting to shore up the breakthrough. Brannan's brigades were approaching from the north, and Negley's fresh division was deploying just to the west of the Lafayette Road in the Brotherton Field. A soldier from that division remembered, The battle was raging fiercely in the forest along the Chickamauga. Batteries of artillery and brigades of infantry were moving on double quick to the support of our forces on the battle lines. We could see the smoke of battle rising above the trees, almost shutting out our view of the forest, while the roar of artillery and rattle of musketry was deafening. Negley sent his two brigades west and sent back the rebels under Clayton. They were the only ones still holding a position west of the Lafayette Road. It was about 6 p.m., and the rebel threats in Vineyard Field to the south had been contained, and the breakthrough at the Brotherton Field was thrown back. Both sides came to rest near the place they had ended their fight. Rosecrans had mostly reacted to Confederate attacks the entire day, and as a result, the chain of command was disorganized with only George Thomas commanding a coherent organization of troops on the north end of the field. Braxton Bragg had committed a lot of divisions into the fight, but he still had some that had yet to fire a shot in the battle. Patrick Claiborne's division had just arrived on the field, as well as Thomas Heinemann's division. Before night completely covered the battlefield, Confederate forces would launch one more attack. Cheatham's earlier retreat around Winfrey and Brock Field caused Leonidas Polk, the general in charge of that sector, great concern. He hoped to throw back the Federal divisions in his front and help stabilize the overall Confederate line as Stuart's brigades were pushing into the Union rear during the breakthrough. They would be the ones thrown into battle against Richard Johnson's division near Winfrey Field. Later in the afternoon, the two rebel brigades stepped off and Walthall immediately came into contact with Johnson's troops. The well-fortified position of the Blue Troops formed an impenetrable wall for the Mississippians. To the north, Govan's brigade advanced and found no enemy in their front. The 6th and 7th Arkansas did break off to engage some of the Union troops, but the rest passed by the flank. Baldwin and Willock were not oblivious to the rebels going past them. Willock suggested Baldwin move his reserve to the flank and hit the enemy with enfilading fire, which he did. The Federal troops harassed the Confederate flank, catching them off guard. This forced Govan to pull back. Walthall, likewise, pulled back when he realized he could make no headway against the Blue Line. The fresh division of Patrick Claiborne was now in that sector, and Liddell was convinced that a great opportunity could be had if a fresh division attacked the Union line in that location. Claiborne knew Liddell very well. Liddell had served as a brigade commander under Claiborne for nearly a year, but Claiborne refused the offer to attack. Furthermore, it was getting dark, and the Irishman didn't know the ground in front of him. Lieutenant General D.H. Hill, Claiborne's corps commander, arrived on the field, and Liddell reiterated his argument to Hill, who concurred that an opportunity could be had. It was settled Claiborne would attack, despite the growing darkness. George Thomas was working diligently to piece the Union battle line together amid the breakthrough. After Govan and Walthall's failed attack, Thomas ordered Baird to place two of his brigades on the left of Johnson. At this point, Thomas made an important decision. The Union line was now disconnected, with its left too far to the east of the Lafayette Road. At 5 p.m., Thomas gave the Union left the order to fall back and concentrate on more command and ground. When he gave that order, the breakthrough at Brotherton Field was still being fought off by the divisions of Van Cleve and Negley. However, the division commanders did not receive the order until after the breakthrough had been pushed back. Thomas personally rode to the Union left convened with Baird and Johnson, and all three generals rode to the west in order to scout the best ground to place their men. All three generals were gone when Claiborne's men deployed for an attack. Darkness was covering the battlefield, and this led to great confusion for Claiborne's troops. Brigadier General Sam Wood's brigade started off confused, 
For one, wood could not be found and the regiments lost connection with one another in the darkness. When they stepped off, the 45th Alabama surged past its other comrades while the others attempted to feel their way through the darkness. The 16th Alabama came up on the left of the 45th and fired a volley into their own comrades. The confusion led to both of those regiments falling back to the safety of the woods. The regiments that did make it to the Union lines exchanged volleys with one another, but because they simply aimed at muzzle blasts, neither side were very accurate. However, that would not be the case when Colonel Baldwin rode in front of his lines to urge his men to counterattack the rebels. Confederate bullets killed Baldwin and his horse. His troops tried in vain to recover his body, but to no avail. He was most likely buried in one of the unknown soldiers' graves. Claiborne ordered up two artillery batteries to fire into the blue ranks from a distance of about 60 yards. This secured the center of Wood's disorganized brigade. Polk's brigade worked its way around the Union left flank, but because of the positioning of Scribner and Starkweather's brigades, the two Union brigades fired into one another while attempting to fight back against Polk's troops. Baird's men fell back in decent order despite the confusion. Claiborne's 3rd Brigade under Colonel Deschler had lost contact with Wood in the darkness and had traveled to the southwest. Cheatham, not knowing about this disconnect, ordered Smith and Jackson forward to support Deschler. Since Smith thought he was acting in a supporting role for Deschler, he didn't send out skirmishers. Riding at the front of his battle line, Smith found himself in the middle of Dodge's troops. About 30 rifles fired at the mounted figure, and some found their mark. Smith would be seriously wounded and die within the hour. Deschler's brigade did locate the correct location and swung north, overlapping Dodge's line and capturing a large number of the 77th Pennsylvania. With their flanks collapsing, Willick, Dodge, and Baldwin's men fell back and formed on Baird's division. Claiborne did not pursue. His division had pushed back the enemy, just as his superior wanted, and to push further might risk the integrity of his brigades. The entire day of September 19th had been a confusing situation. Union brigades were detached from their normal divisions and corps, and sent to various sectors depending on where the rebels attacked. By nightfall, Thomas Crittenden, commander of the 21st Corps, commanded the Union right, while George Thomas, commander of the 14th Corps, commanded the Union left. Alexander McCook, commander of the 20th Corps, had no discernible command. All of his divisions and brigades had been taken and placed either on the Union right or left, and therefore he was left without anyone specifically to command. The Confederate command was also in a confused state. Four separate Confederate corps were on the field, but the rebels, like the Union, had plucked brigades and divisions from different sectors and threw them into battle alongside different units. Braxton Bragg decided to make two wings, with Leonidas Polk commanding the right and James Longstreet commanding the left. He met with each wing commander separately telling them the battle plan of Polk assaulting the Union position at dawn with D.H. Hill's Corps, breaking the line, and then moving south. Longstreet would then attack and help drive the Union Army away from Chattanooga. Bragg expected his wing commanders to inform their subordinates of the plan. Polk sent the orders to Hill and went to bed, expecting them to be delivered, but they never were. Hill positioned Claiborne's troops before riding off at midnight for Bragg's headquarters. Hill got lost and had to return to Claiborne's position, where Hill found out that he was now under Polk's command. It was now 3 a.m., and Hill set off again, searching for Polk this time. He never found him. Major General John Breckinridge was the other division commander in Hill's corps. Breckinridge spent much of the night at Polk's headquarters, but Polk never told him about the attack he was to make as a part of Hill's corps. Longstreet, on the other hand, after receiving orders from Bragg at about 11 p.m., went to bed, arose before dawn, and notified all of his division commanders of their responsibility for that day. The dawn attack that Bragg had planned was already going awry before it ever took place. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far. History will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the heartland. To educate the world is his mission. A professor of fortune is a man called historian. 
historian.